I'm going to be talking about photosynthesis. Um, photosynthesis is a very important process by which autotrophs like plants will capture solar energy and carbon dioxide and water to make sugars and those sugars could be used as a source of food a source of fuel for cellular respiration that happens in their mitochondria but also they can use those sugars as a building block to grow um, as you may know trees they keep on growing right they grow in height they grow in width and how do they keep building and building and building and growing bigger? Well, they have to make organic molecules and they make organic molecules by photosynthesis. So today we're gonna to be talking about photosynthesis, what's happening in photosynthesis, and also we're gonna be talking about some very important evolutionary adaptations that some plants have. Uh, all right, so let's go ahead and get started. Let me just uh, grab this corner and bring it down. All right, let's actually start on this slide. Uh, in my previous um, video, I was talking about cellular respiration. Most of cellular respiration happens in the mitochondria where cells are making ATP. And one of the products of cellular respiration, as you can see in this diagram, is carbon dioxide and water. And these products of cellular respiration are the reactants or the inputs of photosynthesis. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, photosynthesis is a process by which uh, plants or autotrophs will capture solar energy in the chloroplast and they're going to produce organic molecules like sugar, which is their fuel, and organic molecules to build as a building block to grow. And one of the other products is oxygen gas. And organic molecules and oxygen gas is going to be the input or the reactants of cellular respiration. So you guys can see here in this diagram, it really shows how photosynthesis and cellular respiration are two very different processes that are dependent on each other, that are connected, because the output or the products of one process is the input or the reactant of the other process. Okay, and so how are they connected? As I said, heterotrophs that would be us okay you know we require um, other uh, organisms as a source of food to break down that glucose and cellular respiration along with oxygen we're going to produce carbon dioxide as a waste water as a waste product but we're building and we're making energy and this is what we call an exergonic reaction right it's an exergonic reaction because energy is being released um, sugars are being broken down Whereas autotrophs, these are organisms that make um, organic compounds um, and they make their own food and they're making it from light energy in the case of photosynthesis. So they're going to take carbon dioxide, water, uh, and solar energy to um, make those organic compounds such as glucose and they're going to release oxygen as a byproduct or a waste product. And this is an endergonic reaction. Oh, sorry. And this is a endergonic reaction. Okay. And actually, you can't see it down there on the screen, um, the screen recording, but it does say reduction or endergonic reaction. Okay. Before we actually talk about uh, the related um, factors or features of photosynthesis, we do have to talk about a little bit about plant anatomy. You know, in photosynthesis, we have plants are absorbing solar energy at their leaves. The leaves are sort of like the solar panels of the plant and they need water for photosynthesis. Water is going to be absorbed at the root hairs and the roots. Water is going to move up to the leaves because water is going to be and you're going to see that water is necessary for photosynthesis. So the water is going to move up all the way to the leaves where photosynthesis takes place. There's some gas exchange happening in the leaves. We'll discuss this on the next slide, but basically O2 is coming in or out in for cellular respiration out as a waste product of photosynthesis carbon dioxide is coming in uh, when it makes which is going to be used to make sugar and then also co2 is going to go out um, as a waste product of cellular respiration Res cellular respiration does happen at the roots of plants like o2 can come in at the roots um, that's why it's important that 
the soil around the plant is well aerated. There's a lot of air pockets because they also do cellular respiration at the roots where O2 is coming in and CO2 is coming out. What you don't see here is CO2 going in and O2 coming out but because photosynthesis happens up here in the leaves where they're taking in CO2 and they're releasing oxygen. And then in the leaves is where they're making the sugar, C6H1206, and those sugars can be transported. They could be stored in the root system. They can be stored in as uh, sweet sugars in the fruit. Um, fruit, though, is not really long-term storage of the sugars or energy. It's going to be um, more for the purposes of an animal coming along and eating the fruit and seed dispersal. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about leaf anatomy. So when we look at a leaf, you have these cells um, called mesophyll cells. Mesophyll cells are the cells in the leaf that have chloroplasts. That's, that's what these little green dots are. They're chloroplasts. Those are the organelles where photosynthesis is taking place. You also see a vein, right? You see veins along the leaves. The vein is where the sugars that are being made in the mesophyll cells get transported. They go into the vein and then they go to maybe the root system or the fruit. And then also the vein is where how water comes up from the root system, okay? Um, you have on the underside of the leaf, so you could see here like the leaf is flipped over. The underside of the leaf you see stomata, okay? Stomata are basically little pores and um, they're funny looking um, structures. You've got actually two cells. There's actually two cells and they're called guard cells. Like the guards open and close the pores. The guards like to the gate, okay? Stomata are like a gate where they open and close. And when they open up, CO2 goes in for photosynthesis to make the sugars and O2 comes out as a waste product. So there's a lot of gas exchange happening here in the stomata. Um, CO2 goes in and when CO2 is being um, captured, uh, to make sugar, we call that carbon fixation. We'll talk about that again when we go over the Calvin cycle. But CO2 is coming in, carbon is being fixated, it's being drawn in and being put in a molecule of sugar. Okay, so this is uh, the guard cells and this is a nice microscopic photo um, uh, of guard cells that make the stomata. And also transpiration is taking place here as well. You know, water is going to be drawn up at the roots and the water is going to actually go all the way up to the leaves and water is going to diffuse out of the leaf, or I should say evaporate out of the leaf. So H2O is also coming out of the stomata. Okay, like on a really warm, windy day, a lot of water is going to evaporate out. If it's really dry outside, water evaporation happens pretty quickly. And that's called transpiration. When plants draw up that water and um, lose the water at the stomata. Okay, so um, as I said at... I think I said this at the beginning. If I didn't, I'll just say it now. There's two parts to photosynthesis. You've got... The light reactions, that's the first part, light reactions, and then the second part of photosynthesis is called the Calvin cycle. And you can see this is a nice diagram that kind of summarizes the inputs and the outputs of the light reaction and the Calvin cycle. In the light reaction, you've got light coming in, it's going to power, it's going to fuel the reaction to happen in what we call the thylakoids. Um, Water's coming in from the roots, right? Water's coming in from the roots, entering the plant cells and then going to the, the um, chloroplast, to the thylakoids, and then oxygen is going to be a waste product, a byproduct of that water coming in. And then in the light reaction, you're making ATP, you're making NADPH, they are going to be used for the Calvin cycle. The Calvin cycle is what we call the carbon fixation cycle because the C, the carbon and carbon dioxide is coming in to the carbon cycle and it's coming out as sugar. Okay, you can see that here. And so all of this, the Calvin cycle requires ATP and NADPH. 
ATP is going to be the energy. It's going to be the energy that's going to rearrange molecules in the Kelvin cycle. NADPH is going to be an electron carrier. Um, there's molecules in the Kelvin cycle that are going to be reduced, meaning that they're going to gain electrons. And as a result, when ATP is used, you get ADP and inorganic phosphate. And then when NADPH drops off electrons in the Kelvin cycle, you get NADP+. And they're going to go back to the light reaction, where in the light reaction, you make the plants make more of NADPH and more of ATP, which are going to be used again in the Kelvin cycle. So you could see this recycling of ATP, ADP, inorganic phosphate, a recycling of NADPH and NADP+. Um, don't get NADPH and NADP, sorry, NADH and NADPH um, mixed up. Uh, they basically do the same thing. They are, you know, electron carriers. But think of the P for photosynthesis. That's the electron carrier in photosynthesis, whereas NADH is the electron carrier in cellular respiration. So I probably should have talked a little bit about the... Uh, the uh, chloroplast uh, structure, chloroplasts, which are the organelles in plant cells where photosynthesis is taking place, right? It's got a double membrane. It has two phospholipid bilayers. And then it also has these stacks of phallicoids, okay? They sort of look like pancakes. And these pancakes also have a phospholipid bilayer. So each phallicoid has a phospholipid bilayer. It's like a flat stack, okay? Um, and uh, out here, okay, the fluid that surrounds the thalicoids is called the stroma, okay? So don't get that confused with um, stomata, which are the pores. Stroma is the fluid uh, in which the um, thalicoids are like in, in the, in the chloroplast, okay? The Calvin cycle takes place here in the stroma, whereas the light reaction takes place here in the thalicoids, okay? And so each thalicoid, so um, uh, let me just label this one, okay? This guy right here is a thalicoid, T-H-Y-L-A-K-O-I-D, whereas a stack of thalicoids is what we call granum. Okay, granum is singular, whereas grana, G-R-A-N-A, is going to be plural. Okay, so yeah, this is a chloroplast where photosynthesis is taking place. Light reaction takes place in the thalicoid membranes, all right? The Calvin cycle takes place in the stroma, the fluid within the chloroplast. All right, so um, when we talk about photosynthesis, we also have to talk about light because plants have something called pigments that absorb light. And so white light or light from the sun uh, consists of several colors. You've got red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, or otherwise known as um, Roy G. Biv, right? R-O-Y-G-B-I-V, violet. And you know, white light, it can actually be separated when the light sh is shining through a prism. And that's because the different colors of light have different wavelengths. And so when they go through a prism, they bend at um, different angles. And so when uh, light shines through a prism or water, like water, if there's a lot of water in the air, then the water drops or raindrops can form a rainbow in the sky because the light from the sun, it's going to separate into the different colors of the rainbow. So you've got red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, and red has the longest wavelength. So I think I will show you that on the next diagram that red has a uh, wavelength of 750, 700 to 750 nanometers. Okay, so when we say wavelength, we're talking about like the distance between crest to crest. Okay, that distance for red color is going to be um, 750, around 750 nanometers. That's like 10 to the minus 9. That's really small. Whereas violet is going to be smaller wavelength, so it's going to look something like this. Um, the distance between crest to crest is going to be like 380, so it's going to be really short, okay? And the shorter the wavelength um, means that there's like a, a higher frequency. It's going to 
it's going to travel with much more energy. Okay, there's a lot more energy in shorter wavelengths. So white light from the sun that you know we can see, okay, uh, it's called visible light. Invisible light is just a small fraction of what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. 380 being the purple to red, which is 750. Um, if we get any smaller in wavelength, we've got UV or ultraviolet radiation, which is like, uh, you know, ultraviolet, like shorter than the, uh, the violet uh, wavelength. And as you guys know, UV radiation, which is also being um, given off, radiated by the sun, is very powerful and it can actually penetrate several layers of your skin and it could lead to skin cancer, right? Because those UV rays and those UV um, waves, okay, can go through your skin and as it's going through your skin, it can bump your DNA break bonds and mutate your DNA causing skin cancer. We have to talk about the absorption spectra because plants have what we call pigments. Pigments are molecules that absorb certain wavelengths of light while reflecting other wavelengths of light. Take for example here, we've got chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. These are two very um, common pigments that are found in most plants. You've got carotenoids as well, which are found in most plants. These are three different pigments, and there are many, many pigments out there, but we're just discussing three in this graph, and this graph is called uh, absorption spectra because it shows you what uh, wavelength that these pigments absorb the most, okay? So when we look at chlorophyll A and B, they seem to absorb a lot of the purples and blues, and then over here on this side of the graph, oranges and reds. But where they do not seem to absorb is between the greens and maybe a little bit of the yellow, okay? And so, you know, I'm sitting here in front of a window and I'm looking outside and I see a lot of plants. Most of the plants I see out there are green and they're green because they have a lot of chlorophyll A and B and it's absorbing from the sun. You've got, it's absorbed, they are absorbing from the sun, you know, the blues and the reds, but what they are not absorbing are the greens, okay? So they look green to my eyes because the green wavelength from the sun is being reflected off of the plants and it's not being absorbed by these pigments and so they appear green to me because all the other colors are being absorbed. They're, they, chlorophyll A and B are absorbing all the blues and purples and the oranges and reds but it's reflecting the green and that's what I see with my eyes. Okay, and so, um, you know, these pigments are going to be embedded in these proteins and these proteins are embedded in this phospholipid bilayer of the thalicoids okay so these thalicoids like i mentioned are the they look like a stack of pancakes okay within the chloroplast it is a phos each one has a phospholipid bilayer it's a membrane with embedded proteins and then embedded within the proteins you have these pigments chlorophylls like chlorophyll a and b looks a lot like this okay lots of hydrocarbons as you can see and then right in the middle okay it's called the porphyrin ring that's like the light absorbing head okay of the chlorophyll molecule it's got a magnesium atom and that magnesium atom can absorb solar energy and when it absorbs solar energy it, uh, electrons are going to be bumped away from it light's going to hit it and it's going to lose electrons okay and those electrons are going to move through the thalicoid membrane through what we call an electron transport chain and it's going to be powering um, something we're going to be talking about that in just a few minutes when we go over the light reaction okay but this is what pig the chlorophyll a and b pigments look like okay it's the magnesium atom in the middle that's going to be absorbing that solar energy it's sort of like an antenna. You can think of them as being like antenna absorbing solar energy, okay? So here's a nice diagram that shows you light, right? Being absorbed by the thalicoids, but green light is gonna be reflected because chlorophyll A and B are the main pigments um, found in plants. All the other colors of the rainbow will be absorbed. Green is the only one that's not gonna be absorbed. 
Okay, and so this is a diagram of the light reaction. So what's happening here is that, and you do have to remember all the parts of the light reaction, okay? Uh, you do need to know all about photosystems, all about the uh, chloroplast molecules within the photosystem and what's happening here. So I'm gonna go through it, okay? Um, so what happens is that in the thalaquine membrane, so let me just put this into context here. Remember, this is a pancake, okay? This is the thalakoid, the pancake. You've got the phospholipid bilayer, and you've got the embedded proteins with embedded pigments that absorb light energy, okay? This first protein that we're talking about in this electron transport chain is photosystem 2, or PS2. And PS2 has a very special... Uh, chlorophyll A molecule called P680. Okay, it's called P680. Uh, P for pigment, 680, which is the wavelength that it, it absorbs the best, and 680 is a red color. Okay, so light's going to hit photosystem 2, which has chlorophyll A, P680. P680 is a chlorophyll molecule that's going to lose two electrons. Okay, and that's what this yellow arrow is showing. It loses two electrons. And these electrons are going to be passed down through this electron transport chain. It goes through PQ, and then it arrives at this protein called the cytochrome complex. And you guys, the cytochrome complex is also, it happens to be a proton pump, okay? A proton pump. And just like in cellular respiration with the electron transport chain, stage three of cellular respiration, as the electron moves through it, it powers the proton pump to pump protons into this thalakoid space. I was almost going to say inner membrane space because that's what happens with the mitochondria, right? But it's going to pump protons into this thalakoid space. And you're going to see a buildup. You're going to see a buildup of protons happening here in the thalakoid space. So what's happening is we're building up a concentration gradient. And if you remember for some, from cellular respiration, right? That concentration gradient can be used to make ATP. And guess what? Here we have the same enzyme, ATP synthase, where the protons are going to simply facilitate a diffusion. By simple facilitated diffusion, they're going to diffuse down their concentration gradient into the stroma, and ATP will be made, okay? So that's actually the first half of the light reaction, okay? Um, what I didn't talk about was, though, was, you know, the P680 in photosystem 2. When it loses those two electrons, those electrons need to be replaced, okay? And they will come from water, water. So what's going to happen here is that water, and I'll just write it up here, okay? But it's happening here in the thalakoid space. That water, H2O, is going to split. It's going to split into two electrons, comma, two protons, right, and then an oxygen atom, okay, and then that ox oops, and that oxygen atom is going to combine with another oxygen atom from another water molecule to make O2. It's eventually going to become O2, a waste product of photosynthesis, but the O2 that we need for respiration. So when plants release that oxygen, we breathe it in, okay? That O2 comes from water. So next time you're watering some plants, remember, that O2 that you're watering the plants with is eventually going to become oxygen that you're going to breathe in, okay? So the two electrons right here that um, come from water, those two electrons, they are going to move up. So I'm going to write two E's. They're going to move up to the P680, okay? So that P680 that originally lost those two electrons, they're going to be replaced by two electrons from water. And then those two protons right here, these two protons are just going to be out here or in here in the thalakoid space, adding to that concentration gradient um, inside the thalakoid space, okay? And so that's like the first half of, of the light reaction. Now we've got to talk about the second half because there is a photosystem 1 or PS1. Within PS1, you have a chlorophyll A molecule called P700, Okay, and P700, again, pigment, P for pigment, and it absorbs 700 the best, which is a red color. It absorbs it, 
And guess what? It's going to lose two electrons. Okay, it's going to lose two electrons. And these two electrons are going to move down this very small electron transport chain and ETC until finally, that electron, those two electrons meet up with NADP plus to make NADPH. Okay. Um, and then those two electrons lost by P700, they need to be replaced. And guess what? They are replaced by the two electrons that originally came from P680, okay? So P680 originally lost the two electrons, are going to move through this proton pump, powering it to produce this concentration gradient, but the electron keeps going. It moves on to the second um, ETC, a second electron transport chain, replacing the two electrons lost by photosystem 1 or P700. P700's electrons will go to NADP plus to make NADPH, okay? Um, so again, this concentration gradient that's being built up by this cytochrome complex or proton pump as the electron goes through it, powering it to build this concentration gradient, it's going to be used to make ATP, just like how it happened with cellular respiration electron transport chain. Um, those protons are going to move down their concentration gradient into the stroma, and that ATP synthase is going to make ATP. Okay, and what is what happens to this H plus? It's out here in the stroma. Well, it could be pumped back into the thylakoid space when the electron goes through cytochrome complex or that proton pump, those H pluses are going to come back in. So those H pluses or protons are just kind of being recycled. They're moving in, being pumped in, building up this concentration gradient, move down their concentration gradient outside, pump back in, move down, pump back in. I mean, all of this is this amazing process to make ATP. But you guys, that's not the end of the story because ATP is needed, NADPH is needed for the Calvin cycle. And everyone, the whole point of, not cellular respiration, but the whole point of photosynthesis is for the plant to make sugar. And that sugar is fuel, it's food. It's a building block, right? So it's gonna use that ATP, NADPH, to make the sugar, which is going to happen in the Calvin cycle, all right? So this was the light reaction. And now this is the uh, Calvin cycle, otherwise known as the carbon fixation cycle. All right. The carbon fixation cycle. Why is it called carbon fixation? It's because the CO2, the carbon and CO2 is being brought in and put into a molecule that's going to become sugar. OK. Um, so that CO2 is going to come in. And it's going to combine with a molecule, a five carbon molecule called RUBP. RUBP or ribulose biphosphate is going to combine with carbon dioxide and it happens using an enzyme. There's an enzyme called Rubisco. Remember we talked about enzymes, enzymes speed up reactions, right? And Rubisco is a very, very important enzyme that is responsible for step one of the Calvin cycle. You know, each step requires an enzyme, but it's not even mentioned here because you don't need to know them. But Rubisco is the only enzyme that you absolutely need to know because it's so important. It's the enzyme that brings together the carbon dioxide and Rubisco. It's the one that fixes CO2 to make sugar. OK, so it's going to bring in the CO2. It's going to bring in the RUBP and bring them together to make a six carbon molecule. OK, uh, because carbon dioxide is one carbon, whereas RUBP has five carbon. So five plus one equals six. OK, and you're going to end up with a six carbon molecule that is short lived. It's just a really um, short-lived intermediate it doesn't last very long it immediately splits into in half okay into three carbon molecules I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw some circles to represent the carbons okay and it shows it here but I'm gonna do all of the carbons I'm gonna draw all the carbons so um, there's three carbons it says uh, three carbons entering one at a time but I'm gonna go ahead and draw three carbons so these are the three carbons from carbon dioxide. They are each going to meet up with RUBP. So there's three RUBP. And 
uh, Rubisco is the enzyme that's going to bring them together. Okay, so so this is right here. Um, that's RUBP. I hope you guys can see that. I hope that I'm capturing this on my um, screen recording. The carbons from CO2, carbon dioxide. But they're gonna they're gonna form a bond. Rubisco is gonna have them form a bond. So now we have three molecules of what we call intermediates. Okay, so these are three six carbon molecules that are intermediates. But what's going to happen is that it's short-lived and it's going to break up pretty quickly, okay? Using a different color, maybe I'll use um, blue. They're going to split right down the middle, okay? They're going to split like this, right down the middle. And now you have one, two, three, four, five, six. You have six molecules and these are called PGA, six PGA, okay? PGA stands for phosphoglycerate. PGA is phosphoglycerate, okay? And these uh, six PGAs, they're going to become phosphorylated. This is where the first ATP comes in, okay? Each one gets phosphorylated, okay? I mean, phosphoglycerate, the P tells you that they're already phosphorylated, but six ATP are needed to phosphorylate the other side of the molecule, okay? So that's why you can see there was already a phosph uh, phosphate group here, okay? And then now we're adding another phosphate group here. So we need six ATP to phosphorylate all six PGA. Once all six PGA are phosphorylated, we get um, six molecules of 1,3-biphosphoglycerate, or we call it PG, oops, we call it PGAL, okay? So we go from PGA to PGAL. We have six of them. Now the six PGALs are going to become um, reduced. They're going to gain electrons. And when they gain electrons and actually um, phosphates are also removed, you end up with six G3P, okay? We have six G3P, okay? And I, I, I'm going to draw them. Okay, so we've got th six of these guys. Well, only one of them is actually going to leave the um, Calvin cycle, okay? One of these are going to leave the Calvin cycle, and you can see that here. It leaves the Calvin cycle to go make sugar. It's going to become glucose, okay? It's going to go make sugar. It's going to make the, the food, the building block of uh, photosynthesis. The other five, okay, these five, G3Ps are going to move on. Okay, these five are going to move on into the Calvin cycle. They're going to be recycled into the Calvin cycle. So for all, for six G3Ps, one is going to exit the Calvin cycle to make that sugar, which is the fuel or the building block of plants. The other five are going to move on and continue and be recycled. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to redraw the G3Ps. There's five of them. Okay, so I've got five G3Ps, okay? And so what happens next here is that ATP is going to be used, okay? And this third phase is what we call regeneration of the CO2 acceptor or RUBP because RUBP accepts the CO2, right? RUBP is what CO2 co combines with to make that short-lived intermediate. Well, ATP is needed here, energy to rearrange, what's gonna happen is that those five G3Ps are gonna be rearranged molecularly to make um, three RUBPs, okay? And RUBPs are five carbon molecules, but we have five three carbon molecules, right? We have 15 carbons total. Well, three five carbon molecules makes 15 carbons total. Um, so just to kind of help you visually see what's going on here, for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to circle. That's one, two, three. Okay, I've got three RUBP, right? So those three RUBPs, which are five carbon molecules, are going to be rearranged, uh, are going to be made when ATP is used here, okay? So we've got three RUBP. 
and those RUBP are going to combine with CO2 via the enzyme Rubisco. Rubisco is going to create a six carbon intermediate, very short lived. Those six carbon molecules are going to split immediately into six three carbon molecules called PGA. PGA gets phosphorylated into PGAL. PGAL gets reduced. Okay, it gains electrons to get G3P. You've got six G3P. One G3P is going to exit the cycle. The five are going to move on. The five that do move on get rearranged with, by ATP, and you get three RUBP. RUBP is going to combine with CO2 via Rubisco to make a six carbon intermediate, which splits right down the middle pretty much immediately to form six molecules of PGA, so forth. So every time this is happening, by the time you get to G3Ps, one is going to exit, the other five is going to continue. So this is why we call the Calvin cycle, because things are moving around and being recycled, okay? So what is coming out of the Calvin cycle is the sugar. That one G3P is coming out and it's going to be used to make sugar, okay? So that's the Calvin cycle. Um, so you'll also notice that in the Calvin cycle, it actually uses up more ATP than NADPH, okay? So that's what we're going to talk about next. Uh, you can see here that in the Calvin cycle, we use up 6 ATP here, 3 ATP here for a total of 9 ATP. 9 ATP is required here. And then how many NADPHs are used? Just 6, okay? 6 Na. D, P, H. But in the previous slide, when we talked about the, um, the light reaction, you know, we just drew maybe one NADPH that was made from the two electrons from the pigments. And we just saw one ATP being made in this diagram. So what happens because there's more ATP required, more ATP required in the Calvin cycle, there's something what we call cyclic photophosphorylation. Okay, it's called cyclic photophosphorylation because the cell want the cell or actually the the chloroplast wants to make more ATP than NADPH to kind of replenish the ATP that's used because it may, Calvin cycle uses so much of it. Okay? So remember uh, in the light reaction how the electrons from P680 and PS2 move down this concentration gradient, right? Sorry, move through this electron transport chain. And as it moves through the electron transport chain, the cytochrome complex pumps protons into this uh, thylakoid space. Well, um, instead of, okay, instead of the electrons from P700 moving through this other ETC to the final electron acceptor, which is NADP+, that electron from P700 goes back to that cytochrome complex. It goes back to this first electron transport chain. Okay, so this electron from P700, instead of going to NADP plus to make more NADPH, the chloroplast doesn't want to make any more NADPH. It wants to generate more ATP because it requires more ATP for Calvin cycle. The electron is going to go back to the first electron transport chain, go through the cytochrome complex to pump more H pluses into the thylakoid space, building up this concentration gradient so that more ATP can be made. Okay? So the whole purpose of the cyclic photophosphorylation is to make more ATP and um, not so much of the NADPH because we need six NADPHs uh, to make sugar and we need a lot more, not a lot more, but we need more ATP to make sugars. So we need nine ATP. So this is what we call cyclic phosphorylation. So just a summary, light reaction, we're producing ATP, we're producing NADPH. Um, H2O is consumed, right? Remember when P680 loses two electrons, those electrons need to be replaced. They're replaced when water is split up. I think I forgot to mention what that's called. Uh, when water splits up, when that water splits up here, H2O splits up into electrons and protons and oxygen. This is what we call photolysis, okay? Photolysis. Uh, because this is a light reaction and we're lysing 
water. Water is splitting up into electrons, protons, and oxygen, okay? So yeah, that um, water is consumed. It splits up into protons, electrons, and oxygen. And then that oxygen is a byproduct or a waste product of the light reaction, and it's going to be released from the chloroplast, released from the cell. It's going to exit through the stomata. It's going to go out the stomata into the air, okay? The Calvin cycle, it consumes that CO2, that CO2 is coming in. Remember, that's called carbon fixation. And they are producing sugars, which is the food or the building block for the plant. And it uh, ATP, ATP is used up, so ADP and inorganic phosphate, they go back to the light reaction to make more ATP. And then it also regenerates NADP+, where that is the electron acceptor in the light reaction to make NADPH, which is going to help reduce uh, molecules in the Calvin cycle to make G3P, which is going to make sugar. Okay, so that was the, the summary, right? Where photosynthesis, we're making glucose and oxygen. In cellular respiration, those are the inputs. The glucose and oxygen are the inputs for cellular respiration. The outputs of cellular respiration is CO2 water, which is the input for photosynthesis, okay? Okay, so um, this is just a drawing of the guard cells that make up the pore, make up the stomata. The thing is, is that a lot of plants, the plants that we're, a lot of plants just on, on really hot, dry days, they want to conserve water. Like conserving water is a priority because as you guys remember, if they lose water, they'll start to wilt, right? And they don't want to wilt. They want to be able to be upright. There's a, they want to have as much trigger pressure as possible so they could be upright so that they could do photosynthesis. But when it gets too hot, they'll actually close up their stomata and because of transpiration, which is the loss of water through the smog, they'll close it up so that they don't lose any more water. So on hot or dry days, they'll close their stomata to conserve water. But what else is going into the stomata is CO2, right? CO2 is also going in, but if it's closed up, there's no CO2 coming in. If there's no CO2 coming in, then there's no Calvin cycle. If there's no Calvin cycle, there's no sugar. If there's no sugar, there's no food, and there's no growth, okay? So that's how plants could possibly die on a really hot or dry day. They close up their stomata and they can't make any food, okay? Um, the guard cells will close, okay? And this can create problems, which I just mentioned, okay? But remember also in the light reaction, the O2 or the oxygen is being released in the light reaction. The CO2 is needed for the Calvin cycle. If it closes up the stomata, can the O2 come out or be released into the air? No. So what happens is that there's a, um, there's actually, let me just uh, write this down, okay? No CO2 coming in, okay, coming in. No O2 exiting. Okay, so that's a problem, right? No CO2 coming in to make sugars, no O2 exiting. So as a result, within the leaf, there's going to be an O2 buildup. Oxygen is going to build up within the leaf, all right? And that's going to create problems because there's something called photorespiration, okay? So photorespiration is when oxygen levels are high in the leaf and there's not a lot of carbon dioxide coming in. And rubisco, as we know, is a very important enzyme in the Calvin cycle. The thing about rubisco is that it can also bind oxygen and not just carbon dioxide to RUBP. Remember when we talked about enzymes, how enzymes are substrate or reactant specific, like they only allow for a certain substrate to fit, right? Remember the Remember I drew like this is our enzyme, this is our substrate, and the substrate fits into the enzyme. If it's a different substrate, like maybe it's shaped like this, it's not going to fit into the enzyme. And so we say that, um, number two, we say that enzymes are reactant or substrate specific, but Rubisco is one of those enzymes that is not that picky. Okay, in this case, it could be CO2 or oxygen. 
okay? And if there's a lot of oxygen building up and Rubisco doesn't have carbon dioxide around, Rubisco is going to take oxygen and join it up with RUBP. And you're going to end up with an intermediate molecule that is five carbon, not six carbon, okay? And so that five carbon molecule is going to split into two molecules. That's three carbon. That three carbon can actually become eventually G3P. It can eventually become G3P, but it's not going to help make sugars efficiently because you need as many carbons coming in to the Calvin cycle as possible. Okay. And then this two carbon sugar or sorry, two carbon molecule is going to actually go to the mitochondria um, where it's going to be you know, broken down. Um, and, you know, it's kind of pointless because that's that carbon dioxide is just going to, or that two carbon compound is going to be broken down and it's going to be broken down to carbon dioxide. Okay. Some of that carbon dioxide can come back into the Kelvin cycle, but it's usually just lost and it's kind of pointless. Okay. So this is what we call photorespiration where like, remember how in respiration it's O2, right? In cellular respiration, but it's photorespiration because it's related to photosynthesis. And in the Calvin cycle, instead of CO2 coming in, it's O2 that comes in. And really, it's not making a whole lot of sugar. Um, it wastes um, time and energy within the plant. Um, and so it's not very efficient way for plants to make sugar, to make food. So photorespiration is, is not a good thing, okay? It's not a good thing for plants. When on a hot, dry day, they close up their stomata and oxygen is building up because of the light reaction, Rubisco can capture oxygen and combine it with the five carbon RUBP to make this five carbon intermediate. And you're not gonna make a whole lot of sugar, okay? It's kind of a waste of time and waste of energy, okay? Um, but we are going to talk about two plants that have these very amazing, unique adaptations. You have the C4 plants and the CAM plants or CAM plants. The plants that we've been talking about in terms of just photosynthesis in general, they're called C3 plants. C3 stands for carbon three. There's like a three carbon compound that's made. So going back to the Calvin cycle, um, you have PGA. PGA is the first three carbon molecule, okay? So that's why it's called C3 plants is because they make a three carbon molecule. It's like the first thing that they make. But anyways, um, C4 plants, they're called C4 plants because you guys will see in just a minute, like corn and sugarcane, they can capture CO2 only. They only take in CO2. They're not taking oxygen. They take in the carbon dioxide and take put it into a four carbon compound and then they're going to do the Calvin cycle. They don't have to open up their stomata for very long and you're going to see why. Okay. So yeah, an example of C4 plants are sugarcane, corn, and other grasses that live in very hot, dry climates. So uh, they have a better way to capture CO2. These are really amazing plants. They have a better way to capture CO2 so they don't have to open up their stomata for very long. If they're adapted to hot, dry climates, they open it up, their stomata for just a little bit of time and they can capture enough CO2 to do the Calvin cycle. So they have two very special adaptations that C3 plants do not have. They have an extra enzyme. They have an extra enzyme that's part of photosynthesis. And this enzyme is called PEP carboxylase. And unlike Rubisco, it only binds to CO2. There's no, it doesn't bind to O2 at all. It only binds to CO2. So you guys, you can think of Rubisco, okay? Rubisco is the friend, it's the person. That's a little wishy-washy. It could go for O2 or it could go for CO2. It can't decide on who it wants to be with, right? Rubisco is that person, that person that you might know. It can't decide, do I like O2 or CO2? Or if there's a lot of O2 around, I'll go for O2. If CO2 is not around, out of sight, out of mind, right? They're not going to go um, for the CO2. Whereas PEP carboxylase, um, enzyme only has eyes for CO2. It only has eyes for CO2. And so it takes in the CO2. It temporarily takes that CO2, combines it into a molecule that is a four carbon compound, and then it's going to release that CO2 to Rubisco. Okay. 
So PEP carboxylase only has eyes for CO2, but it's eventually going to give the CO2 to Rubisco because Rubisco cannot be trusted, okay? Another um, adaptation of the C4 plants is besides PEP carboxylase, they have an extra cell, an extra type of cell. And you can think of this extra type of cell, which is called the bundle sheath cell, as being like the dungeon, okay? It's like the dungeon. It's the dungeon where Rubisco is kept because Rubisco is so unreliable, okay? Rubisco is kept there away from oxygen and only carbon dioxide is going to enter the bundle sheath cell. Rubisco will take in that carbon dioxide, combine it with RUBP to do the whole Calvin cycle, to start the whole Calvin cycle, okay? So what's happening? is that, let's start over here. Remember how we said the mesophyll cell is where photosynthesis is taking place, right? Well, the carbon dioxide comes in, uh, PEP carboxylase takes that carbon dioxide, combines it with a three carbon com compound called PEP, and you end up with a four carbon compound called oxaloacetate, and you don't really need to know that. You can just say PEP carboxylase uh, it will fix carbon dioxide into a four carbon compound and that four carbon compound is going to release that CO2 into the bundle sheet cell where Rubisco is. So Rubisco is over here and CO2 comes in, Rubisco takes that CO2, combines it with um, RUBP, RUBP CO2, make a six carbon compound intermediate, which splits up into, uh, sorry, yeah, um, a six carbon intermediate, which splits up into a three carbon compound called PGA, right? PGA gets, um, uh, PGA is gonna become PGAL, right? And PGAL is gonna become reduced and become G3P, which is gonna exit the Calvin cycle to make sugar. Okay, so you've got Rubisco and it's not out here in the mesophyll cell. There's no Rubisco out here. Rubisco is in here in the dungeon, in the bundle sheath cell. Dungeon, bundle, sheath cell, okay? Um, and so that carbon dioxide is temporarily trapped in a four carbon compound. It's gonna release the CO2 into the Calvin cycle in the bundle sheath cell. So with the bundle sheath cell, Rubisco is kept away from oxygen, okay? It's kept away from oxygen because Rubisco is that wishy-washy, you know, um, enzyme that could do carbon dioxide or oxygen, okay? But if you only give it carbon dioxide, that's what it's going to take, fix into the uh, three carbon sugar, okay? So that's C4 plants. So two adaptations. Number one, they have a separate enzyme, PEP carboxylase, that only has eyes for carbon dioxide that can only bind carbon dioxide into a four carbon compound, okay? And the second adaptation is the bundle sheet cell, where Rubisco is, where Calvin cycle takes place. C3 plants, all the other plants that we talked about, they don't have this bundle sheet cell. The Calvin cycle just takes place in the mesophyll cell where all of photosynthesis takes place, okay? Uh, but bundle sheet cell is an additional cell where only the Calvin cycle is taking place. And then that sugar that's made in the Calvin cycle is gonna go into the vascular tissue, the vein, remember the veins that we talked about in a leaf? Vascular tissue, that's the vein. Okay, where it's going to be transported either to the roots or to the fruits. The other, um, oops, sorry. So next, let's talk about camp plants like cacti and succulents, pineapple. Those are some examples of camp plants. Camp stands for crassulation acid metabolism. I think that's how you say it. Yeah, these guys are awesome too, just like C4 plants because they are adapted to hot, dry climates. They also have um, PEP carboxylase, okay? But something that's different about CAM versus C4 is that they actually close up their stomata during the day and then at nighttime is when they open up their stomata. So at nighttime, when it's cooler, they'll open up the stomata, take in as much carbon dioxide as they can, and then during the day when it's hot and dry, they close the stomata so they don't lose a whole lot of water. 
they close up the stomata and then they'll release the CO2 that was captured overnight into the Calvin cycle to make sure, okay? So in the day, they'll release that C, um, CO2 into the Calvin cycle. So one difference between C4 and CAM is that in CAM, you have the carbon dioxide being um, fixed or carbon fixation being fixed into a four carbon compound at night. And then during the day, the carbon dioxide is going to be released to RUBP to do the whole Calvin cycle to make sugar during the daytime. So it's time-wise, CAM separates carbon fixation from making sugars, whereas C4 plants, all of this is just happening at, this, at the same time um, during the day or maybe at night, but mostly during the day, but it's separated by uh, cell, like mesophyll cell is where the CO2 is fixed, but then the bundle sheet cell is where the Calvin cycle takes place. So it's, it's separated anatomically, anatomically meaning like the two cell types, whereas CAM plants, it's separated temporally, okay? Temporally uh, refers to time. Temporal means time. It's separated by time. Carbon fixation happens at night. CO2 is released into the Calvin cycle to make sugar during the day. One thing that they do have in common is that they both have PEP carboxylase. PEP carboxylase is the enzyme that's going to take in and fix the carbon dioxide into four carbon organic acid. Okay, so C4 and CAM are two adaptations where these plants are in very dry, hot climates. And so what they want to do is they don't want to lose a whole lot of water. So they'll reduce the amount of time that the stomata are open. And so C4 plants will open up their stomata for a brief moment in time, capture that CO2 using PEP carboxylase, release the CO2 into the bundle sheath cell where Calvin cycle, cycle can take place. Whereas the CAM plants, are going to open up their stomata at nighttime when it's cooler. They're not going. There's not going to be a whole lot of water loss when it's cooler. So the CO2 comes in and stored in a four carbon compound, and then it's going to be released during the day when the stomata are closed. The CO2 is released to the Calvin cycle during the day. Okay, so that's the summary of C4 versus the CAM. All right, so um, that's basically the end of my presentation. I hope that this video was helpful in helping you understand photosynthesis, which is honestly one of my most favorite topics because it is amazing to me. It's just amazing how plants can be so complex um, and do what they need to do to make sugar. They're autotrophs that take in that solar energy um, to make ATP and NADPH so that they can make the sugar to survive off of as a source of food and as a building block. Okay. All right. Um, I hope that you guys have a wonderful day and I will see you guys soon. Bye. <music>